Um, one thing that I think is Im extremely important with um, depression, and actually anxiety too, is, and not that it, that's all that this relates to in life, but the, the, the issue of forgiving yourself. Um, a lot of times people with depression and, and, and things like that, um, they have an extremely low opinion of themselves. Extremely low. Um, and I think that in, in many cases that, that actually um, is one of the reasons for the depression, not in every circumstance. But I think that it definitely makes a bad situation worse. Um, I'll put it like that. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's important if, if you know you are dealing with this um, is to always stop and ask yourself, why do I feel this way about myself? Why do I feel this way? Um, is it because you feel like maybe you have to pay some penance, like you have to work, you know, maybe you did something really bad and you think that, um, you know, you need to somehow make it better? Um, maybe um, you're holding yourself to a higher standard like you're per perfectionist or something, you know what I mean? Um, where, um, um, you know, it's just never good enough, you know what I mean? Especially, I see this one um, a lot, when there's someone who had a, um, maybe demanding parents or not very present parents, either or. Um, and sometimes the kids take up that and kind of just beat themselves over the head with it and always carry around that burden. Um, sometimes, not all of the times. Um, and then sometimes um, people maybe are, are scared to repeat the whatever it is that they did. And so they just think, you know, if I, if I push myself hard enough, I won't do it again, whatever. Um, but there are some passages that I think are, are pretty relevant to this. Um, the first is Jeremiah 31, 34. Um, and I want you to pay attention to what God is saying about, about this. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Then, then look what he says here. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. When God forgives, he no longer keeps that. It's not that God forgets in the sense of, you know, all-knowing God somehow has memory lapse. That's not what he's saying. Mm -hmm. he, what, what he's saying is that it no longer is counted against you. Mm -hmm. He chooses to. Right. He chooses to just let it go. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And... And we need to realize this. For, when you forgive other people, for instance, you have to let it go. Lo it's, Paul, for instance, said that you know, love keeps no memory of that of that wrongdoing. Okay. Um, now, stay with me here. I know this is well. Okay, that still goes with forgiving other people. How does this apply to forgiving myself? Well, hold on. Give me a second. Um, Mark twelve thirty one says. <coughs> the second is this you shall love your neighbor as yourself you can't possibly love your neighbor if you're not loving yourself I do want to kind of put it out there there is no other commandment greater than these um, 1 John 4 8 now it is important to note that the Bible never explicitly talks about loving yourself. Never explicitly says that. Okay, it just it tells us principles that apply to it. First John four eight. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. However, for someone who's already struggling with with feelings of forgiving them of not forgiving themselves, to then read these passages, it can almost become a thing of discouragement. <coughs> Oh, so I'm sinning by not not forgiving myself. So I mean, it just drives you further into the state of depression, right? And that just makes the situation worse. So you know, I, I let me kind of build on that though. Um, first off, self hate is dangerous. Um, I mean, it's it's I could literally go for hours about about the dangers of self hate, um, the the harm that you cause to yourself to other people. Um, <coughs> And also, I would like to like like it to, to point this out. If you don't forgive yourself, the quality of your life will be, let's just say, much less than it would have been. Yeah. Much less. 
because there's just this this burden that you carry around with you everywhere you go. And anytime anybody says anything to you, you're gonna go to pieces. You know what I mean? People are gonna think that you're a nut job, even though you're not. You know, just because because you go to pieces, you can't hand, handle anything. You know. Um, but with that being said, God can change the heart, and you don't have to you don't have to just accept it and resign resign yourself. You know what I mean? You keep seeking after the Lord. You keep asking Him to change your heart. You keep asking Him to change your mindset. It's a process. There's no such thing as just, you know, oh, this thing that I've been struggling with is suddenly all I'm gone, all gone. That's just not going to happen. In fact, I'll put it another way. We're talking about depression and anxiety. Some people will, will struggle with depression and anxiety for the rest of their lives. For the rest of their lives. See what I mean? It, 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 God doesn't promise an easy life. He promises to get us through that. You see, see what I mean? There's, there's a big difference there. And, um, yeah. So you're, you know, you may have pro have struggles for a long time about, you know, um, self value, but you don't have to accept that. You can still fight it. You see what I mean? You can still seek God. Um, it, it, it self, um, self hate does cause negative attitudes and character traits. Um, you, you'll be a more angry person, more prone to lash out at other people, um, more 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 prone to impulse buy to make yourself feel better. Um, especially if you see yourself as an ugly person. Especially if you see yourself as an ugly person. Um, if if um, let's see, what are some other examples? It just causes you to kind of have a less outward focus, I guess, and a more just kind of no focus, I guess. I don't really know how to say that. More like um, just not being able to function. Yes. That's yes. Like you use cl clarity. You, you lose care. clarity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Apathy. Yes. Apathy. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the longer um, the longer you avoid forgiving yourself, the harder it will be to forgive yourself. And, on a side note, when someone really hurts you, it'll be very difficult for you to forgive that person too. Mm -hmm. um, just as a side note, um, really, self hate is a very dangerous thing, spiritually, emotionally, physically. I mean, it's, let's make a list. You know what I mean? Um, uh, and I, I do want to kind of say that self hate does come in part from pride. Now, some people when they hear, hear the word pride, they think of this: I'm so great. That's just having pride in yourself. Mm -hmm. There's many types of pride. Mm -hmm. um, having pride in, in a hurt. I don't go to church anymore because I've been hurt. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, your pride is in your hurt. Pride is anything that you're lifting up and putting your trust in. Yeah. Be it hurt, depression, uh, low self-esteem, whatever that thing is. See what I mean? And that is is a problem that will that will that will literally cripple you spiritually. See what I mean? Um, can I add something to that? You can add something. Um, I think, too, um, because this is something I've dealt with, is that because I don't, you know, because I hate myself, we'll say, um, I assume that everybody else hates me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... Changes I, your whole worldview. So then I push people away. Yeah. Well, that also, inter obviously, that ultimately uh, interferes with my relationship with God because yeah. I yeah. push God away. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's God that's yeah. I mean that's that's a that's a pretty um pretty good summation right there. I mean I have nothing else to add on that point. Um, hurt people hurt people, mm -hmm. as Serena just said. Um, it's kind of a contagious thing. Um, oftentimes we we kind of fool ourselves into thinking I'm okay. I I just have this bad attitude towards me, and I still love everyone else. Um, but that is a very temporary thing that, that will pass. Mm -hmm. um, this is how God wants us to, to deal with the things that we've done that are bad, even really, really bad things. Learn from it, but let it go. Yeah. God doesn't want us to hold on to things so long that we become guilty, and he doesn't want us to, um, to forget things so quickly that we don't even learn it and keep doing the same dumb thing over and over again. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. There is a balance there, but once again, and, and I I got um, a lot of these points from this website here, allaboutgod.com slash forgiving yourself. Um, but you know, so that takes us to the question of of of, well, a few questions. Do I have to forgive forgive myself? 
Yes, yeah. that that is something that that you will not be able to f truly forgive other people or love other people if you do not. Um, second off, how do I forgive myself? We will deal with that question in the issue of depression because it kind of overlaps on the different things there. Um, where are you guys writing down things from this? I'm just writing down the website. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and and really, I think this is a great start because uh, this slide here because you know dealing with depression. I mean, it, it goes back to this. A lot of people with depression, if not everyone with depression, at least at some point, has a very low opinion of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you, I'll actually add to that. People who go through anxiety, they may have started with a high opinion of themselves, but by the end of it, especially if it's a long recurring thing, that opinion very quickly <laughs> drops. <laughs> and I think too, when you don't, eat, okay, say I, you don't have a, a low opinion of yourself, you know, per se, but then you do something wrong, you have trouble forgiving yourself. That decreases your opinion of yourself. Like it no. slowly uh, deteriorates. No. You see it, and you know, no. you like start deteriorating because. It's just eating you up inside, yeah. and then all of a sudden, your opinion of yourself just gets lower and lower and lower the longer you hang on yeah. to that. So. Basically, what Serena is talking about is called the circle of addiction. Okay, Let's say this line represents your feelings. Everything above the line is really good. Everything above and below the line is really bad. Here you are. You did something really bad, and you feel bad. So you try to do something to make yourself feel better. You're up here. But then it doesn't give you that high that you were hoping for. So you actually end up lower than you started at. So you keep repeating the cycle to get that temporary re relief until finally you end up down here. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you're doing doesn't even give you relief anymore, but yet you're still bound to it because yeah. you're still – see what I mean? It's a circle. Yeah. It's a it's a always um, degrading circle. Which is yeah. why there's so many forms of addiction, you yeah. know, from eating disorders yeah. to, to drugs to porn to shopping. Yeah. I mean things we don't even realize we've – created an addiction yeah. to yeah. make ourselves feel and, and I, I do want to stop something real quick. I heard somebody say this the other day. Um, I got over drugs and drugs, so they can too. And I, I'm not talking... Oh, I, no, I, 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 just, I just remembered you, said, you had said that. I'm, no, I'm not talking fine. about I you. I have done that. No, <laughs> even if you were talking about me, <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty of that. I've done that. Um, but this person said that, and the whole time I was just thinking... But you're still addicted to this, this, and this. You just left drugs behind. You're still spending yeah. money like a, like a. You're still wasting they, your time and money on this. And, right. The drugs right. For something you're else. just substituting, yes. and you're looking down on your on your brother or sister who's caught in this addiction. And, and you, see, what I mean, yeah. that that pride, that 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 self righteousness. It just. Yeah. So I do want to stop that before it goes too too hard. Everyone has, <coughs> everyone that, that is living, is is fighting addiction on something. Right. Okay, so just because you don't have a problem with one thing doesn't mean that nobody else does. Let's say, for instance, Chuck deals with depression and Lauren deals with anxiety. It's, for her, depression might not be that big of a deal. See what I mean? Yeah. But for Chuck, see what I mean? It's not, it doesn't matter about what you have a problem with. It's about what does the person have a problem with. Yeah. Yeah. And remember this. If you guys are struggling with something, remember this. Don't beat yourself over the head. Everybody has an addiction. We're all moving forward. We're all growing. Okay? What people do a lot of the times in church atmospheres with something like this is – anybody know what Pray the Gay Away is? <laughs> Have you guys, you guys know about that? <laughs> Basically, they gather a bunch of uh, homosexual people who want to be Christian, but they're struggling with these feelings of homosexual, and they try to just pray it out of them. That's the whole whole conclusion, and, and – We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, this is a prayer that I pulled off that website that I think really just – I think it really just goes. And I'm going to go ahead and and read it. Dear Heavenly Father, I understand that there is nothing to gain by holding myself in unforgiveness, and there is everything to gain by releasing myself from unforgiveness and beginning the process of healing. I want to move forward and make a positive difference in the future. I confess the ungodly accountability, self-abasement, and the vows I have made to never forgive myself. Because Jesus died for my sins, I choose to forgive myself. To no longer punish myself and be angry with myself, I forgive myself for letting this hurt control me and for hurting others out of my hurt. I repent of this behavior and my attitude. I ask for your forgiveness and healing. God, help me to never again retain unforgiveness in myself or others. Thank you for loving me and for your grace to move forward with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I like how that puts the focus on God. Yeah. How he has to help us do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, Sandy actually made me a copy of the full um, 
Serenity, Serenity Prayer. Prayer. I, mind blank. Yeah, Serenity Prayer. And it just... I think that it goes hand in hand with this too. Because a lot of people in alcohol deal with that too. I mean, yeah. of course, obviously, you know, the Serenity Prayer isn't just for alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, so some quick facts. How many in America suffer from depression or anxiety? Take a guess. 80 something percent. Okay. 92%. Um, no, it's okay. Okay. 98%. One dollar. <laughs> 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 one dollar. One oh one. No, you have to say two dollars. I'm gonna go one above. Him. No, you can go a penny. Yeah, right. You can go a penny. Yeah, and sure. and then that there's always that guy that actually one. gets it. Oh, oh. I hate that guy. Stab him. No, I stopped. I got too irritated about that. <laughs> no, my favorite is uh, let's make a deal though. Oh, oh my gosh, the crazy people in the audience. <laughs> so anyways. About seven percent or fourteen eight million Americans suffer from depression. Oh, no. that? That's, that's now keep like, in mind. Like, no, this is <laughs> no, this is exactly what I was gonna say. Yeah. Um, first off, this is only people who have recurring depression. Not bouts of depression, like bipolar, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and these are also only the people who came forward. Right. But as we're about to see, people with depression oftentimes struggle with anxiety too. And if you know about about people with anxiety, oftentimes they'll seclude themselves to their houses and not go out. Mm -hmm. So obviously they're not going to seek help. So obviously you see where I'm going with this. Right. Right. Um, there are 18% or 40 million Americans who suffer from anxiety, but only one-third get help, according to ADAA. Yeah. Uh, let me run that by you again. One third get help. Yeah. That means there's two thirds of people who struggle with anxiety out there that are that are you know out there just cruising through life trying to trying to figure things out. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. And that's the people that report it. Right, right. once again, that yes. doesn't include alcoholics, drug yeah. addicted people, people in jail. Yeah, so we're just talking about people with anxiety yeah. disorders and the dis uh, de recurring depression disorders. Yeah. Just those people. Just so you can see it only goes up from there. Yeah. In fact, some of these estimates are very conservative. Like, for instance, that 7% on the depression, oh, yeah. um, even of the ones that I mentioned, the recurring and whatnot, um, that's still closer to about 10 somewhere. 10%. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. So let's kind of break the, let's kind of break this up here. Let's say just round it up. 20%. Mm -hmm. That means one out of every five people is struggling with anxiety. One, two, three, four, five. One of you is struggling with anxiety. See what I mean? That just to put it in perspective on a global, I mean, on an American scale, this is this is a big problem. Um, However, as I mentioned, both are, are intertwined frequently. <coughs> um, that doesn't mean that every time you have depression, you're going to have anxiety. Every time you have anxiety, you're going to have depression. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just saying a lot of times they go hand in hand. People yeah. struggling with one will do. If you're, uh, for instance, um, people who go start having like panic attacks and stuff, it's not uncommon as they detach themselves from the world mm -hmm. to get depressed about it. Yeah. People who are depressed mm -hmm. oftentimes work themselves up into a panic. Because, see what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. yeah. But once again, they're not they're not codependent necessarily. Um, so, depression is not the same as discouragement. I want to stop right there. I, st I want to start stop there, but come. You know, you see what I'm saying. Even if I can't say it, um, discouragement is when you're overcome by despair, by sadness, that kind of stuff. Depression is not that. See, some people who struggle with occasionally getting discouraged about different things, like, you know, if somebody died, mm -hmm. um, you know, then go and say, I know what people with depression are, are dealing with. I know what, people, what the bipolar person is going through. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, not not really. Not yeah. really. Um, and, and there is a big difference between depression and discouragement. Um, you know, and, and, and people, honestly, you're going to know the difference. You know what I mean? Discouragement, you're going to feel kind of down. Depression, it's going to be like there's a veil that's just put over your spirit. Mm -hmm. Just a wet cloth. Okay? It's going to be something where you where you, where you just don't feel like doing anything. Even in the daytime, you just it just feels like it feels like it, it, it's an inner feeling. Like, like mm -hmm. there's something wrong with the world. You know what I mean? It's just a whole worldview, a whole... Yeah. 
a whole different thing going on up here. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, literally, you it's see the sun, you see people having fun, and you just, yeah. Yeah, hobbies that you enjoy, you just whatever. You know what I mean? You just start disassociating yourself from the world and different. That's depression, not discouragement. Okay, and I can see Serena itching to say something. You can. Really? Do I have like a... Yeah, you were going like this, like you're about to say something. So are, are, did you want to say something? I mean, you can. Say it. <laughs> well, um, I think discouragement is, you know, discouragement is you lose hope in a situation. And you know, yeah. it may not be complete loss of hope, but you lose hope or you are losing hope in a situation. Yeah. Or depression is you lose hope in life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, like it's not one specific thing. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah. Yeah. There's a real detachment. Yeah. yeah. Detachment. I think that that word I, I think really just kind of really fits with the with the case of depression. Yeah. It's almost like in fact in, in the same thing goes with anxiety, especially during a panic attack. Um, there's just kind of like the feeling like you're just looking at life like you're not even in, in your body body necessarily. You're just like yeah. kind of looking at life. Kind of like you're numb. Right. Numb to right. the world. Like if you're playing a video game or something where it's just something that's happening over there, you know, and you're yeah. just kind of now, obviously, there are different extremes of depression. Right. So, um, what causes depression? Oh my gosh. This is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Okay. Do we want to say um, oh um, a medical reason? Or <laughs> oh, any reasons that, that, that come to mind? Any reasons that come to mind? Go ahead and start. Okay, well, um, it could be something traumatic that's happened. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. You guys have all been very quiet. <laughs> and I want you guys to say something. Can I say one more thing? Yes, you can say one more thing. Serotonin not being uh, pumped into your body. Right. Enough um, if you're talking about the uh, psychological reason, like if you actually have a medical reason, so, yeah. balance, your body may not so, be... Are you in, are aware at all how funny you looked when you said that? You went like this? You went like this. I was chatting <laughs> in a rain man. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you because you just uh -huh. looked so funny when you said that. <laughs> that's because I'm trying not to talk so much. It's really hard for me. No, that's fine. That's fine. No. Yeah, but you guys can't <laughs> resign yourself to not saying anything. I'm doing the same thing. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm done though. Ben, do you have any idea? I'm going to keep coming back to you until you give me something. Anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Childhood influences. Yes. Either what you were told about yourself. Yeah. Yep. Or That's a big one. What happened to you? Yeah. And those begin a cycle of negative thought processes yep. about yourself. Did anybody here grow up into in, in a um in a hell and damnation church? You know what I'm talking about. Then I don't even have to say anything. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So scary to me. Yeah. Um, when everything is about there, the love of God is never mentioned, and everything is always, you know, hell, fire, your sinners, all this nonsense. Well, like the WBC, for instance. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, so Chuck knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Those kinds of things can do it. Anybody else have anything else? Wow. Were you going to say something? I'm trying to think about how to phrase it. Oh, okay. Reminds me of the houseplant song. Ha, ah, you're going to burn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do you mean? It could be even something as being born early. Mm -hmm. That can cause. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Environmental factors. Yep. Oh yeah. Like, I think. Um, um, if you live like in Alaska or something, you know the sun, not having enough sunshine. Yes. Yep. Seattle. Yeah. Highest suicide rate. Yeah. Yeah. Really, you can see just a wide variety: genetic or household. Yeah, genetic. Yeah. Yeah. What you yeah. do? Um. Now, obviously, some of these studies are a little bit hard to kind of affirm genetically wise, um, because genes aren't exactly. <laughs> this is what people think genes are. It's a puzzle. You just go in there and look at the puzzle. <laughs> no. Genes are very complicated. You can't just go in there and find questions to your answers. It's a very complicated thing. Very smart people work on this all the time, and they don't even know everything there is to know about it. You know, and I'm not saying I know how to do it. I'm just saying that I, rec I recognize that, that they, don't. they don't even know everything. Um, but with that being said, 
Um, that could either mean one, or, one, one of two things. Either the place that you grow up, like things will be handed down to you by the people you are closely associated with, like guardians, parents, etc. Um, or that it is genetics. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know one way or another, but that is something. And with that being said, either way, there are some things like what what uh, Nicole already said, where something even as as small as not not even <laughs> not even a birth defect, not even a birth defect. Just a birth that wasn't necessarily full term or this or that or the other thing. I mean, so many different yeah. things that can all add up, you know, to make it whether or not you're going to have a harder time with this or not. Wow. See what I mean? Like all these little details. Our bodies are very fragile. Yeah. Very fragile. I, I mean, mm -hmm. well, that's a discussion for another day. Um, <laughs> lack of diet and exercise or sleep. All three of these things are major causes. Factors that people very frequently um, forget. So let me kind of break that up. Lack of diet. Oftentimes we go to McDonald's all the time mm -hmm. and eat that greasy nonsense food. Gracie, what were you saying? How much of the fa of the fat content was in the fries? Were, oh yeah, were... like in fries, it's only like, or like five calories in a potato, but when you fry, it's like three hundred something calories, and so all of that's coming from the oil. Yeah, you're eating yeah, three hundred calories of fat. Fries are like almost a meal's worth of calories. Yeah. So as you can imagine, if you, if this is what you're putting in the tank, what do you think is gonna run and pour out of the tank? You see what I mean? As a little test experiment, never change your car's oil and drive it until it just dies and see what happens to it. <laughs> it's gonna be ugly. It's gonna be ugly. <laughs> um, uh, exercise. There's something about exercise. First off, it makes us feel better about ourselves while we're doing it. Mm -hmm. It helps us to lose the extra weight, which helps us to feel better about ourselves too. Yeah. Then we get compliments from people, so that helps us to feel better. So I mean, there's just so many different factors about exercising, both in here and out. Yep. Yeah. You know. Um, it also has a, a biochemical yeah, that's what I was gonna say next. Is is um, well, why I didn't is because it's actually further on the list here. Where is it? Oh. Um, <laughs> Maybe hmm. Maybe I'll, I'll get to it later. But anyways, um, about uh, well, Serena already touched on it anyways. Um, about some things you know that, that chemically your brain may not either be producing enough of, or maybe it's just you know there's just a, pro a, a physical problem. You know there are there are things like that that happen. Um, um, different uh, sicknesses or, or stuff like that, like cancers and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, people w with birth defects, like uh, for instance, being in a wheelchair and stuff like that, that's a major cause of, cause of depression. Um, uh, thought patterns, unhealthy thought patterns. Um, once again, Lauren touched on this. Th some things that are worked into us as kids, some things that we just kind of get throughout life, some things that we kind of tell ourselves, so many different things that all kind of combine throughout our life to give us a bad worldview. Remember how we were talking about worldviews? Yeah. The way you see the world? That's going to play a huge factor in depression. Um, these thought patterns develop, and, and they're very hard to break. Um, hopeless situation, something that you see is never changing, that this is just somewhere you're stuck. At a dead-end job, you hear people complaining about this all the time, and it causes them to feel depression. Yeah. Um, a bad family situation, uh, once again, the, the sickness, where it's something where, where – it's not something that has an easy, immediate solution, and it causes you to kind of just lose your umph. Yeah. Um, stress. Stress is a, is a big factor of depression. Um, a lot of college students, for instance, have a problem with this, you know, because they're spending all the other time in their dorm rooms outside, out, instead of outside in the sun. They're not eating very healthy because they can't afford it. Um, they don't have anyone necessarily there at college with them, so they they kind of feel overwhelmed with all the workload. Realizing that they're not in high school anymore, you know, all these different things just kind of combine it, and it's very stressful. Um, that's just college student. Obviously, you can imagine the stress of, of a single home, a uh, single parent um, household, uh, or the stress of um, kids who who have uh, a parent who's addicted to something. So I mean, all these different things um, just make stressful events. Um, loss, uh, a child's, the death of a child, the death of a spouse, the death of a loved one, go down the list. Um, or sometimes something that just something real simple that you've grown attached to. Um, I know some people who've gotten depressed about losing a dog. Yeah. So I mean something that you've that you've gotten attached to, mm -hmm. and it's just uh, kind of has a way of sometimes getting you depressed. Another thing is life stages. Yeah. I wish somebody would have told me this when I was a kid. When you hit about 25, you're going to go through depression. When you hit about 30, <laughs> you're going to go through depression. When you hit about 37 to 40 somewhere, you're going to hit depression. You really, it's every five yeah, years. When you hit 50, you just give up. 
<laughs> well, then, from what I hear, I there's a new level of depression about the you, you start over focusing on the end of your life. Oh. And actually, like, like the end times. And yeah, and, and you st start being all worried about that. Comes into play. You have to oh. fight that. Yeah. Because people will put it on you. They'll be like, "You're so old now." Thanks. Well, I didn't know that. Welcome like to, to our now. crowd. What are you gonna I started the, uh, to. Oh, hold on. Two he, months after huh. I turned fifty, I realized yeah. people keep telling me I'm old and I'm one of them now. And I see them walking around like, oh, and, and no joy. I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, not going there. I lived my whole life in depression. I'm not going there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say, Chuck? Uh, a friend of mine, he, he dealt with it a lot in his younger years because uh, he was adopted. Mm -hmm. And he could never oh, see wow. why his real yeah. parents, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't want him. him. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. You know. So many things left untreated have caused such problems. Mm -hmm. Soldiers who come came back from World War II and World War One, for instance, who are having all these all these mental problems, and you know nobody really helped them. They didn't even know. Yeah. Nowadays, it's like, oh, well, that's PTSD. That's something we need to definitely deal with. See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but anyways, um, so those life stages. You realize a lot of things are going to be life stages. I never realized how much that's going to affect your actual life. Feeling rushed to buy something, feeling rushed to sell something, feeling rushed to change jobs, feeling rushed to, to, to have kids or to, or to get your kids out of your house, whatever. Um, I mean, you, the, the different things that life stages bring on you, just such a level of stress. Yeah. Uh, very hard to cope with. Um, yeah. Um, for instance, uh, the, the, mid, the middle-aged man who, who decides to go out and buy a Lamborghini. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. Midlife crisis, Serena was talking about. You know, those life stages that people you don't know how to adapt to and change to and change with because you've never been there before. Yeah. Exactly. See what I mean? Um, guilt or shame, some things that you've done or people, some things that people have told you that you've done, either or. Um, just as long as it's real up here, mm -hmm. it will eventually be real to you. Mm -hmm. um, and which will cause problems. It does. I've noticed this with people who are in these kinds of situations. It doesn't matter what reality is. It matters what perceived reality is. No. You can't help them on the basis of reality. You have to help them on their level, and you have to find them where they're at and then bring them to another place. What we try to do with helping people who are in situations like this is we try to talk to them like they're on our level. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not, or else they wouldn't be struggling with this. Right. See what I mean? We have to meet people where they are, not condemning them, but giving them a hand up. Or hand out, you know, whatever, whatever you imagery you want to go with there, it doesn't matter. Uh, government or social issues. Mm -hmm. For instance, it's not uncommon for people um, in places that are, le let's just say, less free than America um, to, to be very depressed because of their political um, things going on. Uh, different social factors. Um, once again, this is not exhaustive, just so we're all clear on that. Because um, I, I know I, I, it looks like I actually didn't put it on um, about... Um, uh, it's chemical things in your, in your brain. I, I thought I had it on there. It's not on there. Oh, and I skipped over this one. Uh, sleep. Oh. When we don't get enough, the proper sleep, proper mm -hmm. hydration, take, don't take care of our bodies right, it's going to be harder. Mm -hmm. So if you already struggle with depression, it's just going to get harder for you. Um, so these are just, I mean, this is this is a, a, just a list, not a complete list, but a list mm -hmm. of all the different kinds of depression there are. Reactive. This is this is um, a depression um, in um, in reaction to real or perceived trauma, regardless of whether it's actual, as long as it's perceived, real or perceived. Okay, I want to really pound that in because that's going to be a big factor in anxiety too. Imagining things that aren't really there. Yeah. Okay, and it's, it really ha has a big thing in there. Our, how, what what happens in our thought life changes a lot of what happens in our actual life. Um, what's called Endogenous? I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, this is random, lengthy, and recurring. Random. And nothing necessarily sets it off. You just wake up sometimes and you're depressed, and sometimes you aren't. Mm -hmm. um, um, lengthy, it's not just going to be necessarily a few hours. It could be, mm -hmm. but everybody's different. And recurring. Yeah. It'll come again. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's, kind of, it's almost like you get the feeling of this. 
Right. And, and, right. And it gives you this kind of ominous feeling of, oh, yes. what's the point? It's going to be back anyways. Yeah. Why even enjoy this? I'm going to eventually not enjoy it in enjoy, maybe even a day. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just kind of get this really depressed uh, kind of fatalistic mindset. Hard to hard to really find the, find the horizon on that one. <coughs> um, primary, which means the depression by itself. Okay? You are depressed. But then there's secondary, which is like a side effect. You have cancer and it makes you depressed. Okay. Yeah. See the difference is primary and secondary. Yeah. Um, then there's dis dysthemic, I want to say, I hope. And that's basically a low-grade low depression. Um, you're still fully functioning. A lot of people um, have this and don't even realize that they have it because they're still functioning and they just kind of don't enjoy life. Um, seasonal, uh, Gracie was mentioning about this, like whether – some people are depressed by sun. Some people are depressed by too much rain. In fact – um, going a step further, we actually have a guy in our, that comes to men's meet that um, can't live places where the sun's out, not out too much because his body needs that extra vitamin, whatever, the D or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and because he doesn't get that, it causes him to causes him to have seasonal depression. Yeah. Um, also, um, we were talking about this in the discipleship, recurring cycles of life. Um, something that happens repeatedly on any given week that causes depression. Like let's say Wednesday makes you depressed. Or let's say birthdays make you depressed. Mm -hmm. Or let's say Christmas time, that's a big one, makes you depressed. Uh, honestly, last year it seemed like there was nobody I was talking to who wasn't depressed at Christmas time. Yeah. Which is funny because I hate Christmas time and I was having a blast. <laughs> I was like, share my joy with me. <laughs> but anyways, um, bipolar. Now, bipolar is unique to everyone. There's no such thing as set bipolar. Yeah. It just doesn't exist. Everyone who has bipolar experiences it in a different way. Hmm. And it's it's just a cycle of going from manic to depressed, manic to depressed. And there really is no method to it necessarily. There may be, but on a lot of people, there is not. You just kind of go from one to five to five to one. I mean, it's just – so really – and I want to kind of really caution you on bipolar. When you're, when you're trying to witness someone who has bipolar, tread very carefully and also realize which stage of the cycle they're on. Are they on the depressed state or are they on the manic stage? Should I mean, be wise here. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And and so be wise with how you're witnessing, quote unquote, witnessing, because sometimes we witness to people and we're not actually witnessing. You, you know what I mean? Um, well, and I was going to mention actually, and then I saw it down at the bottom, bipolar. Uh, reactive depression is actually something that's significant to people who are bipolar, bipolar schizophrenic, things like that. Because often it's something that's perceived, not really what's right. necessarily happening. But, see, that once again, with bipolar, it's a little bit more confusing with that because it's also endogenous, too, depending on the person. Mm -hmm. yeah. See what I mean? So, once again... Very complicated. It's very hard. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to uh, communicate with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the thing is, really be careful about this one because let's say, for instance, they're on the depressed side of, side of the cycle. And... You say something, it's going to be perceived in a whole different light than if they're on the manic side. Mm -hmm. yeah. So be yeah. very careful. You You're can accidentally. A severely bipolar family member. Yeah. And you would go visit them, and yeah. sometimes you would get in the house and everything was fine. Other days, you thought you would have thought you shot their dog. They you were not coming in this house. They hated you. You were their enemy. Yeah. And you had to just leave. Because yeah. They would hurt you or themselves. You know, they oh were kind of they would get dangerous. Uh, obviously, you can see how relationships can sometimes be very hard for these kinds of people, who, who which makes it just all the harder for them. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, because of that, of that, you know, manic depressive thing going on, um, they push people away. Some many times, completely accidental, mm -hmm. if not all the time, depending on the person. Um, and so, you know, there's nobody who, who who hangs out with them, and so then they, they feel, oh, there's no one here who lo who likes me. You know, I, I'm just kind of a disease on the world. You know what I mean? And it's just a very next to it. There, there's no easy solution on this. Uh, postpartum and PMS. I didn't know this was a thing, but <laughs> some women have such severe postpartum that they actually end up killing their kids. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, some women have such severe PMS depression that. I don't know if they kill people, but they get awful darn close. I mean, um, really, um, really depressed states um, during those times. Can I just add something about the Go government ahead. and social issues? Which one? The government and social issues. Yes, yes. My counselor and my psychiatrist both 
refuse to let me watch the news because of it. Mm. Because it can pull you in uh-huh. such a low low. Yeah. yeah. It's right. I, in such a high high. high. No, but it's seriously. Pending. I don't even struggle with depression, and if I watch the news, I get depressed. Yeah. The whole world's going to hell. Oh my God. There's nothing I can do to change anything. Why even vote? Why not just live my life in my house? And then my parents don't help it either. Because they're like, oh, you need the social commentary. to see what goes on. Like, no. Nope. No. Doctor says no. Doctor knows it. And honestly, yeah, that's, 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 that is a good point, um, though, about the whole um, avoiding some things, you know, um, if... And we'll get to this more later, but, you know, if there is something that sets off your depression, be aware of these things. And we'll talk about that later, though. Um, and then there's there's um, there's major depressive. Once again, this is not exa- exhaustive. Major depressive is very intense. Very intense. Um, these are, are, are usually the people committing suicides and that kind of stuff. Just really intense depression. Um, now, once again, though, major depressive, you could technically be uh, postpartum and have major depressive. So, it, mo- major... These aren't all different kinds of depression. They're, they're depression and different ways and forms that, that depression can relate. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, yeah, depression is a very complicated thing. It, it kind of concerns me that so many pastors just kind of write it off so lighthearted. I just want to thank you for addressing it, it the way like you good. are. Because I'm a great guy. <laughs> you are. Um, there are a number of us in here who have struggled with it. And, and you know, there's such a stigma even and especially in the church. No. And, you know, like, for years I was afraid to tell my pastor mm. that I had been institutionalized. No. And I was on medication because there's something wrong with me. You know, <laughs> it, it was just, it's so hard in the church because people <coughs> think it's okay to have any other kind of sickness. Yeah. But mental not sickness. Mental sickness. Yeah, nope. Wrong That's not something that God would allow. It's <laughs> yeah. something that you sinned and you need yeah. to repent. Yes. Yeah, or you're just not trusting God. Yeah. Oh my gosh! If I had a penny for every time I heard that, you're like, what? <laughs> Lauren's mortgage would already be paid off. <laughs> Um, so what is depression like? I was going to ask this question, and I decided not to, for obvious reasons. Um, because I started thinking about it and thought, you know, if there's someone with depression here, I don't want them to just f- be forced to, you know, put them in an awkward position. So I'm just going to plow through these. Um, depression affects uh, your obviously your four realms there, feelings, thinking, behavior, and physical, he- um, physical health. Um, and feelings, um, uh, kind of, it's hard to kind of, Describe it in such a concise way, but um, shame, worthlessness, guilt, um, very low opinion of yourself. I already kind of talked about this. I'm um, thinking a lot of negative thoughts, um, really just a lot of negative thoughts. In fact, I would go a step further and say sometimes with people with depression will use gossip or, or complaining kind of as a crutch to get themselves either heard mm-hmm. or to make themselves temporarily feel better, yes. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, low concentration level, obviously. Um, people with depression very strongly uh, have a problem with with, the, with concentration, which is kind of terrible. Were you gonna say something? No. Oh. I'm just joking, um, sorry. Because you know some pastors say, oh, you need to go read the Bible, but they try to read the Bible and they kind of lose concentration because right. they're depressed. There's no focus. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, well, that's kind of a self defeating thing. You know what I mean? And it, sometimes it's it gets mixed up with ADHD as well. Yeah, that's true too. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing about it is, as much as doctors know. They don't know there are so many wrong diagnoses that I've yeah. seen over the past two years, even. <laughs> like, I'm not even going through my whole span of lifetime. It's just like, wow. Okay, all right. Like, okay, here's a good example. Um, back in California, I fell off a bench. I sprained my arm. Eight hours later, oh, it's just a sprained arm. Crack, crack. Done. I go home. Hurt really bad, but I was fine, and I went home. Eight hours later. This was in California. It wasn't like I was in, like, some backwards hospital on the moon or some nonsense. <laughs> but anyways, um, pessimism. I think that one kind of goes for its – speaks for itself there. Yeah. Uh, difficult with memory. Um, have a hard time uh, remembering things. It kind of goes right in hand with the concentration. Once again, these are not exhaustive. I'm just trying to show you how depression deals in all four of these realms. Behavior, apathy. Nicole already mentioned this. Um, you just kind of don't care about stuff. Uh, no motivation. It's not necessarily that you're lazy. You just don't care. 
You just have a very low drive. Um, withdrawal. I mean, these kind of are speaking for themselves here. Um, complaining. Uh, sometimes it goes to the point of lacking hygiene, and I'm not talking about um, working out necessarily. I'm talking about um, just kind of getting so depressed you don't even get up and shower. You just kind of stay in bed. What? You don't care about yourself right. anymore. So. Right. Right. People who who take care of themselves are the people. I'm sorry. People who who um, either care what other people think or care what they think are the people who are gonna get up and, and take care of themselves. People who are in a very low depressed state, they just don't, don't care. care. It's just, see what I mean? There's no um, drive, I guess, for for the hygiene. And not saying that everybody with depression, you know, doesn't take showers. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, in its advanced stages, depression can keep people from from taking care of themselves. <laughs> uh, physical health. This is obvious. Um, anybody going with, going through depression of any kind uh, has experienced this. Fatigue. First off, you're always tired, um, which goes hand in hand with the whole apathy thing. Um, lack of interest in pleasurable activities. Um, if you're married or if, if you're not, you know, either way. Low sex drive. Um, low um, enjoyment of hobbies. Low, you know, just different things that, that maybe you found pleasure in just not really doing anything. Um, aches. A lot of pains in the body. Um, and this is kind of a, a dual thing. Um, they feel these things and they get depressed. And because they're depressed, they feel these things. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a repeat of cycle. I don't want to oversimplify depression. Depression is not simple. Um, loss of appetite. Some people overeat with depression. Some Most people that I know undereat by a lot to the point of scary. You know, I've seen a lot of people with depression who, I mean, just to clarify things in case there's anybody who's wondering... Both are bad. They're both yeah. doing damage to your body. I'm not exalting one or the other. I'm not. Both things are very harmful to your body. Um, and, and, and obviously, I'm not trying to guilt trip you. You know, if you're some, if someone here is dealing with this, um, you know, it's something where, where depression causes causes that, that, that thing, you know. So, um, anyways, um, what are the effects of depression? This is a question. What are the effects of depression? And you don't have to answer. Just think about it. If and you can answer if you want, though. Isolation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. Go to the extreme of, of your family or friends just pushing you away. Yeah. Because they don't want to deal with it. Yeah, that's true. A lot of times it can lead to um, self harm. Yeah. In ways. Yeah. yeah. It's not an it's not an uncommon thing for people to die of suicide. I mean, sorry, for people committing suicide to be to for it's not uncommon for people with depression to commit suicide. Yeah. Yes. Jeez, why was that so well, hard to even, say? Even even you know I don't know how big of a deal this is now, but just a few years back. All the kids that were cutting and stuff, yeah. you know, it was a big deal. No. <coughs> now, I'm gonna get to this later, but I, I I'm gonna go ahead and say it now since Chuck mentioned this, um, you don't have to agree with this, but a lot of times psychologists will categorize self harm. For instance, slitting of the wrist they'll see is important, but not necessarily as important because slitting the wrist is usually the least effective means of suicide. Mm -hmm. Usually, um, there are a lot more efficient ways of suicide. That if they are aware of these other ways or talking about these other ways, yeah. that's when the psychologist really starts to pick up the. See what I mean? Yeah. And um, so I mean, by all means, I'm not trying to. I, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with this. <coughs> I think we should take every case as as important. And I do think we should help anybody who's who's cutting or anything like that. I'm I'm not. I'm just saying psychologists will usually um, uh, categorize and prioritize. Yeah. Um, Which the thing with that is, um, eventually it's going to escalate. Yeah. Um, because I know yeah. somebody that cut their wrists. Yeah. Put themselves in the bathtub. They didn't die. Yeah. But that warning was not heeded. Yeah. Nobody right. paid attention. Yeah. So then eventually it escalated. Until the person ended up successfully taking it over. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing they say is whenever someone brings it up, you know, 
um, to ask them how yeah. they're planning to do it. Because yeah. then they put thought into it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what a heavy topic to talk, to talk about. I mean, honestly, this is not our typical joyous topic, is it? Um, unhappy, inefficient, illness, decreased sexual interest, low self-esteem, withdrawal, suicide, or attempted suicide. Let's break these up. Unhappy. Obviously, people who are struggling with depression, the, the effects of that, there's not going to be a happy situation going on, either with them or the, with the people close to them. Um, inefficient, their work their work is going to go downhill. They will be very, very ineffective at work. Um, different things that, that, you know, they're. Well, I think that kind of goes um, hand in hand. Illness, um, people who get depressed will oftentimes have an illness that follows shortly after. Um, there's something about our immune system that kind of just kind of dies a little bit when we get in a, in a depressed state. You know, uh, um, it puts a lot of strain on our body. Uh, depression puts a lot of strain on our body. In fact, some people, because of depression, um, struggle with weight issues. Um, actually, I was talking to someone, I think it was two weeks ago, that because of depression, it looked like they overate, but they didn't. It was just the depression just wore on their body. You know what I mean? It wasn't anything that they – they were eating the same things I was. But once again, the depression just wears on your body. Um, decreased sexual interest. Um, it's very rare for a man, unless he just has low testosterone, um, to not be interested in sex. Very, very rare. But that's one of the, one of the things that happens in um, – like midlife crisis, for instance, they'll go sporadic with their sex drive. Mm -hmm. Either they'll wanna they'll wanna have sex with anything, or they just won't wanna have sex with anything. You know I mean, um, kind of it just kind of messes with with you. Um, low self esteem. We already talked about this. If you if you have depression, you will eventually come to the place of low self esteem. But I already mentioned the circle of how it repeats itself. Um, and you know, I want to kind of put something else to rest. Some people say, and I know I'm doing a lot of talking tonight. Roll with me on this. Um, some people say, you know, like for risk cutters, since that was mentioned, I'll just use that as an example. They're just doing it for, for attention. Yeah. Let's assume, let's just assume that there's 15 kids who cut their wrists and 14 of them do it for attention. Why not? Let's just, you know what, let's just say you're right. Okay? What about that one who isn't doing it for attention and it escalates, like the case that Serena already, already mentioned, to the point of suicide? Because they weren't just doing it to fit in or to whatever, or this or that or the other thing. So I mean, we can't just come rush to these conclusions about depression and different things and suicide attempts and just well, this is the this is the view that that fits what I believe and so I'm just gonna stick with it. So I mean, there's enough there's enough narrow-mindedness and stuff. Anyways, we really need to be careful. Also, if um, somebody is cutting themselves for attention, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. A, there's other ways to get attention. Yeah. Wrong. That's un, that's negative attention. Right. There's a problem. And you know, even if it even let, let's follow this through. Um, depending depending on the type of the type of, of wrist cuts and that kind of stuff, since we're already on that topic, I'll just stick with it. Um, it, it tells a lot about the different mental disorders that are probably there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was just sim with a simple talk with it with a with a with a counselor, psychologist, or anything really, they can very easily figure out what the problem is, yeah. very easily, mm -hmm. and potentially save that kid and that person's life. Yeah. Not that children are the only people cutting themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, potentially, you could say you could save a life, and even even if they never do commit suicide, the level of of, of self harm that they're inflicting on themselves, oftentimes they'll say things just like "I just wanted to feel alive" and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And mm -hmm. yeah. that is an issue in itself that needs to be addressed, regardless of whether it leads to suicide. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. Just wanted to feel right. I mean that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. but, that's a problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Regardless of your own opinions on the, on this topic, as a Christian, it's very important that we take it seriously every time. Every time. And that we do any, anything that's within our power without freaking out. You yes. can you can bring calm to the situation, but do everything within your power to help somebody. Um, which are, I already mentioned those things. Okay. Uh, be aware of anyone who knows best, best methods of suicide or talks about it. Whatever else is drop, drop whatever else you have going on, and this needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. Either you need to call someone, or you need to stay with them, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who who's talking about suicide or already is, knows the best methods of suicide, this is a problem. But check already mentioned this. So, um, <coughs> what does the Bible say? Now I'm going to talk about some passages that are oftentimes misquoted, and then some that are not. 
Psalm 43.5 is a good example of one that is not. Psalms, people don't understand the book of Psalms, and oftentimes they take it way out of context. Do you know that the things in Psalms are not necessarily to build doctrine off of? Right. They are real people struggling with real things, and they wrote a song about it, about mm -hmm. how they felt. Mm -hmm. So did you know sometimes in the Psalms it's not resolved? There's a conflict in the Psalm that is not resolved? Because in life that happens. You're going to go through some things that's not resolved, and you're going to do something to express that grief that you're feeling, but it's not going to be resolved necessarily in that time. So Psalm 43.5 is just an example of this. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. You see the conflict that he's in? I'm I'm in this. It, says, it doesn't say, why were you? It says, why are you cast down? Yes. He's in a level of grief. He's in a level of despair. And he's he's trying to fight it. He you know he's trying to see God. He's trying to trying to he's not hasn't given up yet. But he, there's still that pull and towards despair. Yeah. See that struggle that's there. Imagine that you had written these words and then start asking yourself, what can I detect from this passage? What what can I see from what's going on in the scripture here? See what I mean? Um, oftentimes people think that the Bible being infallible and inspired means that we have to take everything literally and completely take it out of context to do so. That's how we got the whole name it and claim it nonsense that we talked about a hundred times already. So, anyways, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Would you say he was depressed? I would say he was depressed. He said he despaired of life itself. I think that's quite de quite depressed. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 8-9. Um, and why I, why I went to the great extent of separating depression from despair. Or, yeah, um, is no discouragement. That's the word I used. Is because a lot of times the Bible says stuff about you know don't let your hearts be troubled and that kind of stuff, and people take that out of context to apply to people with depression. Oh, See what I mean? Yeah. No, God, 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 the Bible's not talking about people struggling with depression like bipolar. Right. He's talking about people who allow themselves. To worry about something, who will allow, allow themselves to focus on something, and I'll even add this: some people who are struggling with depression. Sometimes don't control their thoughts when they can. I know sometimes they can't, but you know when they can, and they cause it to get worse. Like Nicole already mentioned, watching news when you know it's going to make it bother you. See you know what I mean? So, uh, 4, 8 through 9. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. It was up there. Um, obviously, that that idea of of the struggle and the conflict, you know. And I already said this once. Some people struggle with depression will go to their grave struggling with depression. It doesn't matter the end result. It matters today seeking the Lord. See what I mean? Don't give up today. And we'll talk about different ways to not give up. But okay. Second Timothy one seven. This is about panic or anxiety, um, and people have taken it so far out of context that I even wonder. Why read Second Timothy if you're gonna you're gonna take this so far out of out of context? Second Timothy four seven. One I'm sorry, seven. one seven. Yeah. Oh, and I missed seventeen through eighteen on Second Corinthians. Let me go back. Chapter four, verses seventeen through eighteen. Okay, here we go. For this light momentary aff affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Mm -hmm. Basically what he's saying is this. You're going to have your struggles, but it's not about the here and now. It's important. Keep your eyes on the end result. <laughs> yeah. People who struggle with depression their whole life, one day they will not. One day they will not. Okay? There is a silver lining there, and that's what he's trying to affirm there, is that there is something better that's coming. This is not all that there is. Um, Saint Timothy, now I'm ready to go to this, 1-7. Out of context, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. <sighs> People who start with anxiety attacks have heard this repeated to them so many times, it's almost sickening. 
What does anybody know what Paul's actually talking about in this passage? Um, is he talking about being murdered? No. Well, kind of in a way, but not so much. But kind of, kind of. Um. Well, since you kind of stole my thunder slightly. Uh, <laughs> you bet. That's right. <laughs> but you didn't give a full answer, so now I have to give the full answer. There you go. Um, <laughs> go back to verse 6. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of, of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. He is saying you shouldn't cease back from this task that God has called you to do. Mm -hmm. In this case, God has called Timothy to, to pastor at the Church of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. And Paul is telling him, keep fanning it to flame, don't, don't give up, basically is what he's saying. God didn't give you God didn't give you a fear a, a, a spirit of, of of the word translated here as, as fear is is also the same word translated as cowardice, so that gives you an idea of what the word is. He didn't give us a fear of shrinking back from what he called us to. A spirit of shrinking back. He gave us a, a spirit of um, a power and love and self-control. He gave us things to enable us to the task, not gave us things to keep us from the task. Right. So what does that have to do with panic attacks? Nothing. Right. Absolutely nothing. You know how many times when I was going through my panic attacks, people quoted this to me? Really? has nothing to do with panic attacks. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. All right? Nothing. So <laughs> if there's anybody here struggling with this, this is not talking about that. And you shouldn't beat yourself over the head because but God gave me a, a spirit of love. Why am I having fear? <coughs> the amount of um, the amount of stupid things that I've heard in my in my life in, in Christianity, like and you know the thing is, I was talking to Lauren about this a little while ago. There are so many people who genuinely think that they are just so well intentioned and they say such dumb things. Yeah. It's like you can't yeah. see that you're tearing the person down. Yeah. Goodness sakes. Some people, this is what people think. If I haven't dealt with it, it's not a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Or it's Would, not as bad as Or it's not as bad. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's not as bad as you think. Well, I mean, I didn't, I don't have that. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will wear, what you will drink, or not about you. That's fine and everything. He's talking about being anxious about different things in life. But this isn't the same as panic attacks, okay? People who are struggling with panic attacks, anxiety disorders, for instance, are not necessarily <laughs> fearful of anything, just fearful of fear. Yeah. yeah. Not all yeah. the time. Sometimes there are certain phobias. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is, is uh, you know, he's talking about stressing yourself out about, but I don't have money for, I don't have money for rent this month. I don't have money for clothes. I don't have money for food. Yeah. God provides for the needs as you seek after Him. Mm -hmm. That's right. This is what He doesn't do, though. God provide me for me my rent money when I'm gonna blow all my money on my animals. Mm -hmm. Sell the animals, use the money for your rent. See what I mean? Like he's not gonna he's not gonna keep pouring blessings when you take his blessings and throw them out to the street. What does he tell us when when when, when judging somebody? He says, "Don't throw pearls before a swine." Mm -hmm. So you think he's gonna throw his pearls before a swine? Mm -hmm. It's the same concept there. See what I mean? You can't take a blessing from God and just misuse it and then expect God to keep dishing it out. Right. And what makes a difference? The person who seeks God and the person who doesn't seek God. Mm -hmm. Once again, I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody here. Mm -hmm. If you if you if you know you're doing something wrong, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. If you know you're doing something wrong and you're seeking God, mm -hmm. see the difference there? Yeah. <sighs> people <sighs> who tear down other people. <sighs> the Bible is a great tool. The problem is it's often used as a weapon. And it's not a weapon. <laughs> not a weapon. Um, so that takes us to anxiety, and we're not going to go real far on this. Anxiety, there's something that psychologists talk about called fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And that's the urge within you to either um, face something or run from it. Like, for instance, <laughs> when you were a kid and all the lights were out and you needed to go to the bathroom, but, but you were afraid of the dark. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's that fight or flight. Should I go or should I hold it? Mm -hmm. Fight it or flight? See, and it's a very basic instinct. Everything has this. Animals have this. Mm -hmm. Fight or flight. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very basic thing that everybody feels. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens with anxiety disorders is your switch gets broken. <laughs> it's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. Um, y your body's going to tell you to run when there's nothing necessarily to run from. Mm -hmm. okay. It becomes very increasingly difficult to maintain composure. When everything in your body is saying, flee, flee, you fools. Um, um, 
uh, some of the things about about anxiety, uh, oftentimes it's not uncommon for people with anxiety to feel like they're having a heart attack. In fact, did you know that the grand maj no, I shouldn't say it like that. A lot of um, ER visits are from people with anxiety disorders who assume that they have something wrong with themselves. Yeah. And that's because of this thing right here. Right here. Create problems and believe them. If you have anxiety for long enough, you will actually create reasons why you're feeling like this, and then you will believe those reasons. Yeah. Like, you'll make up this whole delusional world and actually live there. You know, like, oh, well, this is because of this, and, and, and it doesn't matter what anybody tells you. That's just the way it is. See what I mean? Like, you literally deafen yourself to, to the truth, and, and I don't know <laughs> why. It's just something that, that you do. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Um, there was really no method with how I did it. There was just things to, I don't know. I don't know. And then sometimes it's out of just um, embarrassment, you know, just mm -hmm. trying to make something up so people will leave you alone. Yeah. Um, so there are different things like that. Mm -hmm. Um uh, shortness of breath is one of the main causes as your heart gets going um, you, you cause you to lose, lose your breath uh, lose your breath a lot of people have who, are, who go into the ER with chest pains and stuff like that anxiety attacks that are that are left untreated um, not all the time so if you are concerned that you're gonna have that you are having a heart attack you should at least get it checked out yeah. what if it is a heart attack just you know yeah. don't go yeah. and say that I didn't tell it's, that I told I people know, to just Plow through his heart attacks, okay? Um, fear of fear. I mean, this sounds crazy to anybody who has never gone through panic attacks or, or anxiety disorders. Um, another thing is uh, very strong tra transference. For instance, if I start talking really fast, people with anxiety start getting really anxious. But if you start talking slower, they kind of get drawn into that calm, and it helps them yeah. to relax. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with someone who's going through anxiety, it's very important to control how you're portraying. First off, you want to give yourself a relaxed feel. Don't cross your arms or anything. Be relaxed. Slow your breathing and slow how you're talking. Even though it sounds like you're talking to a child or something like that, or maybe to a scared dog, it will calm the person down. Yeah. If you're struggling with anxiety, let the breath just flow. Breathe through your stomach rather than your chest. Just Then talk slower. See what I mean? Do little things like that to remind yourself. <coughs> and we'll get to this in a little bit. I'm going to talk about dealing with depression and anxiety. Um, but I think that this is a good summation of, of the different things with anxiety. Um, uh, the, the last thing right there. Um, or actually, I forgot this one too. Impatient. Obviously, people with anxiety are going to be very impatient. Yeah. They don't want it done now. They want it done yesterday. I mean, they're... Do you know what I mean? And it just sometimes even people who are workaholics, for instance, will give themselves as anxiety attacks just because they're so high strung all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we'll talk about this later, but sometimes people will actually give themselves anxiety attacks by drinking a bunch of coffee or other caffeinated yeah. beverages, by eating too much bread that has gluten in it, different things like this. Um, in fact, some people, uh, well, we'll go into that for a different time, but um, our diet really does matter. Okay. Um, symptoms of serious conditions. I already mentioned heart attack, but other, other things are very common too. Um, some people can convince themselves that something terrible is going to happen or is happening, um, and you know th that will cause repeated anxiety attacks. But then on the other side, some people develop an anxiety disorder out of nowhere, and it goes away out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. It really just depends the person. Yeah. Not only that, but some people ex experience very excessive anxiety, and some people don't. Some people have recurring anxiety or panic attacks or whatever, um, and it never really reaches the height of this other person who had it just once or twice. Because, once again, different people handle, handle it differently, but then also there's different extremes of it. Yeah. You know. So, anyways, um, but the, no, really need to pay attention to that. Create problems and believe them. Hmm. People with anxiety attacks will just create things. Yes. You know, oh, I'm having... Um, what is one that I've heard recently? Um, I can't think of one right now. Um, okay, here's I, I, I this is a lame one, but I'll use it. I think I have cancer, and that that's why I've been so tired lately. Oh my gosh, I have cancer. You know, and you start yeah. freaking out. You start it's freaking out, on TV. I have right? And it, yeah, it, it, it goes, it goes past her. That's what it's called, yes. hypochondriac. Yeah. Yes. When like literally, you have everything that everybody else has. Right. <laughs> now, once again, though, you you can't be a hypochondriac without anxiety disorders, though. Yes, talk um, to you.
<laughs> Seriously, Eli has everything. You'd be surprised at the things that this guy has. I mean, um, does it ha uh, one thing um, with anxiety that is important to notice is just kind of – I'm not encouraging laziness, okay? If there's something you need to do, get it done. You know what I mean? I'm not encouraging that. But oftentimes we'll kind of drive ourselves to anxiety by making small things really big things. Yeah. So stop and ask yourself this. Does it have to be done right now? Oh, well, I have to go to the store and pick up this and this. Hold on. Those things aren't really that important. But I won't have food. You don't have anything in your house? Well, okay, yeah, I have some things in my house. Yeah. So calm down. It's okay. Right. Still, you can still go to the store and get whatever it is that you thought was so important, you know, but don't freak out about it. It's not something to freak out about. Um, and also ask yourself this. What are the consequences? Mm -hmm. If I don't do this, what are the consequences going to be? Yeah. For instance, the Oasis. I have my shift tomorrow night. But what happens if I can't be there? Not that big of a deal. Either Chuck can be there or Gracie can be there. Someone can be there. It's not that big of a deal. See what I mean? You just you make things that, that you are blowing way out of proportion, and you simplify them. Yeah. It's not that big of a deal. See what I mean? Yeah. Um, and here's another one. I'll use this since this is actually something that, that with my panic attacks that I, that I actually had. Um, what happens if I can't lead, lead worship? People had church services without worship leaders for a long time. It's yeah. not the end of the world. People have sung a cappella before. Mm -hmm. Our church has sung a cappella before. I remember one time, suspiciously, you had to do the Wednesday night. <laughs> Sucker. Um, and there was no instruments. So, I mean, there something will work out. So, I mean, people – and I'm not, once again, not condoning laziness. Get things done that need to be done. But don't blow them out of proportion. Yeah, you know, there's some things that just aren't – there aren't worth freaking yourself out about. Amen. Um, um, now, okay. Some things that cause anxiety. Now, I'm self being self-absorbed, but not in the negative way that you're thinking. I'm not talking about being self-absorbed as in I'm the greatest thing in the world. Oh. I'm talking about being self-absorbed as in over-focus on the problems that you're facing. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, kind of like, you know... Oh, this issue at work. I, I just don't know if my boss is gonna fire me. I don't even know if I'm gonna have a job tomorrow. So I mean, it's getting, creating that 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 stressful situation. Um, just kind of being overly focused on it. Um, however, one of the worst things you can say to somebody struggling with anxiety is you need to think about somebody else. Because before they can think about somebody else, they need to deal with the anxiety that they're facing. You need to help them get through that so that they can. See what I mean? Um. Pushing yourself too hard, so many times I see this, especially with people who had an over-demanding parent, a parent who demanded a lot from them. Um, I see a lot of people give themselves anxiety from that, and because they just mirror what they learned from their parent. Right. Did they learn anxiety from the parent? Well, then they're gonna, you know, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not worrying. I'm just concerned. <laughs> well, okay, in the meantime, that worry develops into anxiety. Also, the things that we struggle with inevitably go to our kids. Yeah. Yeah. Inevitable. It's just going to happen. Uh, my dad went through panic attacks when I was a baby. Lo and behold, I end up having panic attacks. Once again, it's the same kind of thing with depression, too. Where kids who haven't even seen their, their real parents pick up the same mannerisms and the same traits. It's hard to write that off. So, um, addiction, um, be, really a lot of different things, um, you know, alcohol, for instance, uh, pornography, really just anything that's going to uh, be an addiction that's going to uh, change the way you're thinking. Um, and we're, we're going to stop on this side for the night. Um, uh, one thing about anxiety, though, is to separate realistic concern from worry, and the Bible does this, too. Like, don't be anxious about your about what you're gonna wear. Realistic concern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but then there's worry. You know what I mean? Where even if there's not, it hasn't happened yet. It could happen. Yeah. See what I mean? Where you just sit there and worry about stuff. Nobody ne it with what ifs. Yeah. N N Nicole, she's not she's not spending money on her credit card like I would. I I, I just wish I could say something. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. So, I mean, you just sit there and worry about it and everything connected to it and whatnot. Now, I don't know if Nicole has a credit card. Okay, that was just an example. Uh, you know, and just the, worrying about stuff. And honestly, most of the time, people who worry, their worry knows no bounds. Yeah. 
Yes. They'll find something to worry about. You take away the situation, they'll worry about something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the problem is the worry, not the, the worry situation. Things are going too good. No, but yeah. seriously, yeah. my mom used to answer the phone yeah. like this: "What's wrong?" Oh my god, she still does that sometimes. Oh my god. Like if we call it an unexpected time, yeah. you know yeah. what I'm talking about. So uh, can I call her. <laughs> yes, call her at two o'clock in the morning. Hey Susan, what's wrong? Oh, I just can't sleep. What's going on with you? Just leave me alone. Tell me a story. So we'll talk about this um, next week, um, but I think that that's kind of a kind of a good place to end on. Separate your a realistic concern from anxiety, and even those realistic concerns, downgrade them. Don't let them consume your consume your mind. And it's very hard for people who, especially, I remember when I first started going with, going through panic attacks. This is never going to change. Yeah. It does. It just takes time. It, it changes. It does change. It does. You eventually learn how to handle them, then you mm -hmm. stop having them so much. And even if you still have them, they're never as intense as they were before. Yeah. So, I mean, you just learn how to, how to cope with it, and you learn what, what causes them. You learn how to avoid how to avoid them, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, um, I mean, it, it, just, just low grade it. You know what I mean? Just yeah. downgrade it. Um, and like I said, a lot of people don't uh, struggle with things like that. You would be surprised how many people come to one of those pastors okay. talking about you know their their anxiety or their depression. So don't feel alone if you're struggling with either of these things. Okay. Um, next week we'll actually get into the more helpful part of the discussion. We'll talk about how to deal with it, uh, how to vent, because we talked about anger and complaining and gossip, but I never said how to deal with those. What? Two weeks. I'm sorry, in two weeks. Oh, next week is canceled. Yes. Um, and because I mentioned all these different things about anger and complaining and gossip, but I never mentioned how to deal with these things. Yeah. You know, so okay, I have anger. What am I supposed to do instead of instead of be angry? See what I mean? So we'll talk about that in two weeks. And also, you know, different things that you can do with depression and anxiety. Um, any questions? No, but I have a, something to say. A comment. <laughs> A comment. Serena having a comment about this? No, I don't believe you. What? Serena, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Talk too much. We're learning. Now that gives me time to uh, eat one of these. Oh, those are so good. No, it's just because you know, like obviously you had mentioned that this is like a pretty heavy topic. You know, like nobody wants to, nobody wants to talk about suicide and stuff like that. Like that. that is, in a, that alone is depressing. You no. know, like, <laughs> if I wasn't depressed before, yeah, I'm you are now. Now. Oh, wow. But, um, and, and, and this is not something that I have the, you know, that I talk about very often, but it's very, you know, goes with the topic or whatever. And, um, you know, my, my, my grandpa committed suicide when I was 10 and then my dad committed suicide when I was 16. And so there was so many different factors involved in, you know, their decisions to commit suicide. And, you know, some said, you know, well, it was genetic. Because both his dad and then him committed suicide. But then, you know, my dad was abused as a child. He started doing drugs at a, and, and alcohol at a very young age. That'll do it, too. And they start and they yeah. said that he, 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 his brain actually stunted yeah. at the age yeah. of whatever he started. When he started doing So he never fully grew up, you know. <coughs> and um, so, which led to a lot of poor decisions as an adult oh. and bad behaviors and things like that. Um, but then, you know, the person I was talking about that, you know, slit their wrist and did, and then it escalated, that was my dad, um, who did a lot of things, you know, attempted suicide a lot before he finally, you know, actually, uh, was successful, but nobody ever reached out to my dad. And I think it's because nobody, everybody just thought that my dad was getting what he deserved. Mm. Mm. Oh, That's a good point. So it's that very point. important wow. that... Whether we think that somebody mm. is. We're that is we, a good point. We need to reach out to people no matter what they've done. No. You know, if we know somebody is struggling with suicide, it's not our job to say, well, he's getting what he's let, let me cut in on this. Sometimes, um, let's actually, that is, that is wow. Wow. It wasn't even in the lesson. Sometimes we can take personal offenses towards somebody and don't even check in on them because of the ways that they hurt us. Yeah. And it yeah. ends up in something like that. Go ahead. But, but that's, that's really just like what I wanted to address was because we were talking about don't, if somebody is talking about suicide or this or that, 
Stop yeah. what you're doing. Help yeah. them. Yeah. If you're not capable of helping them, find somebody that is. You know, call the police, whatever. Right. People had multiple opportunities to intervene with my dad, and nobody ever did because everybody was so mad about things that my dad had done. And, you know, my dad did things to me as a child, but I think now as an adult, you know, like, I would have still helped my dad. And other people should have too. And I think in a lot of ways that it could have been prevented. Yeah. And I'm sure his dad's death could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody just thought yeah. he's getting what he deserves. There is no shame and 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 um, what are they called mental words? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no shame in that. Yeah. yeah. When you need help, mm -hmm. if I broke my leg, would I want a crutch? Yes, I would yes. want a crutch. I broke my leg. Yeah. Right. If somebody yeah. has a disorder, they need help. Yeah. You wouldn't let somebody who has cancer just die, would you? Oh, You'd no. want them to get the treatment, right? Yeah. yeah. You see exactly what I mean? Right. And if you are struggling with something, there's no shame in it. Yeah. I I really think that. Serena, for the past couple of weeks, get out of my head. Because <laughs> Serena, you have you have come to these lessons per more prepared than I have. You keep you keep giving these 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 little stick it notes to end the lesson on. You remember the one with anger? Yeah. Likened it to the whole thing about lust. That was amazing. Boonk. That was and she said so something funny. last week too. Oh, I missed it. Yeah, it's something I don't remember now. It's on. It's recorded either way, so it's online. But get out of my head. <laughs> no, I just want everybody to, if you know somebody's struggling, no, no matter how your feelings about the person, yeah. help them. Uh, uh, help them. Another thought on that is maybe not your feelings, but like too busy. Cause uh, like, ooh, we knew these ooh. two guys. We went to church with them, and one of them struggled with depression and stuff. And he had attempted suicide in that. And the other guy, he, he felt real heavy on his heart to call the guy and talk to him and encourage yeah. him. But he was real busy, and so he oh. didn't. And the guy killed himself that mm. day. Oh, and then he was a he worked in the funeral home, and he had to do the He body. had to clean him up. Holy crap. Mm. Now Can he has to live with that. Yeah. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. He, had to, he had to just leave the... He left after that. Yeah, he, he was quit. like, I'm done. Yeah. But he was just like, I'm too busy. I'll call him tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I couldn't imagine and all he said was wow. that he felt like God told him that he needed to go, like, have lunch with the guy or something. Yeah. Wow. That's dark. That is, <laughs> that is awful. Wow. That would be so hard to And uh, with that, I will stop the recording. Nobody's going to say anything interesting that I'm stop. Go ahead. Well, no, it's kind of, it's more of a personal story. Oh, go ahead. <coughs> um, I was actually helped out of suicide a couple times. Mm -hmm. And so hard when I was in high school. I would get to the point to where... I would be hitting my head on the wall, or I'd be just not wanting to do anything. Mm. And actually, a teacher at the high school helped me out of it. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. And wow. just talk, just taking a minute to talk to somebody helps so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it does. It really yeah. does. Yeah. And encouraging them. To do it. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. <laughs> I want to make sure nobody says anything else interesting after I stop the recording.